hi welcome back to the genetic genius podcast i'm your host dr lulu on this week's episode of the genetic genius podcast my guest mark anthony jd psychic explorer and psychic lawyer discusses the afterlife and how to connect to higher frequencies within ourselves and beyond mark is a world-renowned psychic medium oxford educated attorney near-death experience researcher paranormal expert and legal analyst. He appears internationally on TV and radio and headlines at expos and conferences all around the world. This psychic explorer may be found lecturing at an Ivy League university about quantum physics one day and then off the next day to remote locations around the world to explore ancient ruins and supernatural phenomena. Mark is a featured columnist for the Best Holistic Life magazine and author of three best-selling books. His latest, The Afterlife Frequency, is a riveting story, driven exploration, taking you around the globe from the cosmic to the subatomic into the human soul itself. The Afterlife Frequency has been endorsed by the world's top survival of consciousness scientists and designated by prettyprogressive.com as one of the top books about faith in God. And it's been submitted for a Pulitzer Prize. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so thrilled to have on the show today, Mark Anthony, JD, Psychic Explorer. Welcome. Oh, Dr. Lulu, it is so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. You're welcome. So today we're going to be diving in deep to talking about your new book, The Afterlife Frequency, which I'm so excited to talk about. But first, let's take a step back and talk about you. If you could just set some of that that ground rules or ground <laughs> the ground floor of the talk so we can get to know you a little better, like your impact, your passion, your planetary focus. People always ask me, what is a psychic lawyer? And it's, how about who is the psychic lawyer? Because I'm an attorney as well as a psychic medium medium. And the thing is, Dr. Lulu, I was born this way. I was about three and a half years old, and I started seeing my invisible friends and interacting with them. Now, for everyone out there that has had children, it's not unusual for toddlers to talk to invisible friends. But when mommy and daddy can see those invisible friends, because they both happen to be mediums as well, then it's a whole different different thing. And the truth is that I'm really the first person in generations of my family's mediumistic and psychic history to go public with my abilities. My dad was a U.S. Navy SEAL and a NASA engineer. My mom was a commercial illustrator and artist, and I've tracked the abilities back generations on both sides of the family. And so when I was growing up, I was very focused on going into the clergy. And in in retrospect, that's not unusual for a medium. We tend to be drawn to the spiritual, but uh, I was raised in the Catholic faith. It's interesting. My dad's family was Baptist. My mom's family was Catholic. And and I, I decided that would be too restrictive and filled with rules. So I went into law. Okay, talk about jumping out of the legal frying pan into the regulatory fire. And then I I practiced law for for about 20, 20 plus years, and I was head of a law firm. And so uh, there came a point where I had that aha moment when everything changed. Mm. And when was that particular like moment in time when you had that aha moment? (laughs) It was pretty intense. I, my mother who I was really close to both my parents. They both mm-hmm. transitioned to the other side. We got along really well. I always hear about these people. I had a bad childhood. No, I had a great childhood. Me too. Mom and, and, mom and dad, They, as I got older, they became friends. And I was uh, very close to my mother. And she passed unexpectedly, but not, if that makes sense. She had a number of health conditions. And I remember one day, and I remember exactly the day, I was at my law office and my parents only lived about five or six miles away from me. And all of a sudden I had spaghetti. I wanted spaghetti. And I'm an Italian boy, so that's not an unusual thing. And I pick up the phone, I call mom and she said, oh, honey, I made spaghetti for lunch. Why don't you come over? I said, oh, great. So I go over and I had lunch with my parents and Dr. Lulu, it was just wonderful. It was great. We laughed, we talked. Mom looked tired though. And I had a feeling something wasn't right. And as I went to leave, she came up and she hugged me and kissed me and said, I'm so happy that you've been my son. Love you. 
Oh. And I'm like, I love you too, mom. And, and, and we were very tactile and affectionate family, but this was different. And I remember when I left and the door closed of their house, it had this sound to <laughs> You're it. You're like, oh. okay, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on here? So the next morning I'm in court and the judge's assistant comes out and she says, Mark, we need you in chambers right now. Mm. And we walked there and I could see the look on her eyes and she was holding the phone and she was shaking. And I took the phone and my secretary said, Mark, your father just called, your mom just died. Okay. And I'm, I know that she knew on some level that her time was at an end. And so she said goodbye. Yes. And understandably so, I was devastated. And the thing is, here I am, I've had this ability, I can see spirits, and, but I still nosedived into depression. And the thing is, Dr. Lulu, grief is something that's going to hit all of us, and unless you're a sociopath and completely devoid of emotions, but that's another <laughs> yeah. discussion. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And people think, oh, you're a medium. It should just bounce off you because we're human beings mm -hmm. like everybody else. And so about two weeks later or so, I was driving back from court to my law firm and I'm the head of a law firm. All right. And I was in a very no-nonsense kind of world. So I'm driving and I feel this wave of grief hit me. How mm, you, you think right. you got it stabilized and then that tsunami comes. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I pulled over in front of this convenience store into a parking lot. And I figure, all right, I got to get my composure together. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden this flash goes off. Mm. And I turn instinctively to, to the passenger seat and for a few seconds, I see my mom's silhouette in this silver white mm. light and I hear her voice, let go of the sorrow, but hold on to the love. All right. So I'm trying to process that. And another message hits me, Mark, you've been given the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief, but now you must help those cope with their grief. Mm. And now I'm trying to process that. And then I hear you are to teach people that God exists that heaven, the afterlife exists, that your soul is an immortal living spirit, that you will be reunited with souls in the light that is God. And I'm sitting there drenched in sweat in my mm -hmm. car. And all I can say is, okay. <laughs> and everything changed from that point on. Talk, talk to some people that say, oh, I had this enlightenment experience. I was sitting on the top of a mountain in Maui. Uh, yeah, huh? <laughs> mine was like a fire hose to the face. You know what right. I'm thinking? Well, that's part of being Italian. We're not a very subtle. <laughs> no <ethical>. subtleness. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> talking to me. And, and so they, they were talking to me and mom was at the forefront. And the thing is, from that point on, everything changed. It wasn't like a door open. It's like the door got torn off the hinges and I got kicked right through. Yeah, yeah. With, within a couple of weeks of that, I started writing my first book, Never Letting Go. Yeah. And then within maybe a month or so after that, I was offered a job at a government agency and it was like, okay, this will help me transition out of private practice. Because with private practice, you never get a day off. You right, know, like, no. go. And so then my book comes out and I'm on a book tour and I'm at Harvard. And my manager, Rocky, first, we had a great tour. It was New York City first. And I was on this MSNBC show at 30 right. Rock. And it was cool because the studio next to us, they were filming like some scenes for Saturday Night Live. And oh, so I'm, nice. in this, yeah, and I'm in the studio next to it and I'm doing all this. And that was New York decorated for Christmas and all that. And then we had to go to Boston mm. because I was speaking at Harvard. Well, um, we're at Harvard and it's a clear December day and we're freezing, but it was cool because we're at Harvard and there's Christmas decorations and all this. And my cell phone rings and it's my boss, the elected official. You're missing too much time from work with this book and blah, 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 blah. And I said, I am taking my vacation time to do this. I'm catching political flack because I have a psychic on staff. I said, yeah, I wasn't hired because I'm a psychic. I was right. hired because <laughs> I'm an attorney and I do have a first amendment, right? Hello, separation church state, which is a blurred distinction, sadly, these days. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, but let me make this very simple for you. Please accept this as my resignation. <laughs> yes. and, and he seemed, yeah. And he seemed very <laughs> relieved. And I hung up and I'm like, Oh my God. And I look at Rocky, my manager, I go, Rocky, I just quit the legal profession. <laughs> and she said, Mark, look around you. Where are you? I said, Harvard. She goes, and what are you doing in an hour? 
lecturing about life after death and signing copies of my new book. She said, don't you think you're right where you're supposed to be <laughs> right now? Exactly. <laughs> and here I am today. <laughs> I love that, Mark. Yeah. When we follow our true heart and passion, that's when things really fall into place so easily. Oh yeah. You receive that call. Oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Click. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, I got tired. It was really exhausting working in a government agency and I'm not mm. crashing on the government because obviously right. We have to we have need them that. in some form. <laughs> yeah, we need them in some form, but the unending, oh, there's a psychic on staff. Okay, if I was Muslim, would they be going, oh, there's a Muslim on staff? Yeah. Or if I was Hindu or <laughs> anything, it just got to be tiresome. And certainly as a public figure, I'm, I live under a microscope, if you will. Right. But and when you're a public a, a, a political working for a political agency or a government agency, <laughs> it's excruciating. And I realized or rather it was decided for me. And finally I accepted that it was time for me to embrace my spiritual gifts and fulfill that, that five point message that, that my mother's spirit had transmitted that I'm supposed to help people understand that God exists, that heaven exists, that our souls are immortal living spirits, that we can communicate with souls and that we'll be reunited with our loved ones in the light. And it became very clear to me that everything in my life had led up to that point. And the media labeled me the psychic lawyer. And then through <laughs> lectures and conferences and media appearances, then they me labeled me the psychic explorer because I've spent a good deal of my life traveling to mystical and spiritual locations around the world mm -hmm studying different belief systems, supernatural phenomenon, ancient mysteries. A lot of the things mm -hmm. behind me, I've, New background. I've, <laughs> yeah, I've obtained on the Buddha up there. Oh uh, yeah, the that one's cool. It looks like from Thailand or something. A very good. It was from Thailand. And I was at this city called Nan. Mm. And Nan is near the border with Laos. And we, when my traveling friend, Billy and I, we went into essentially the wilderness. So it was almost like a desert. It was really, really hot. Wow. <laughs> and there was this ancient Buddhist temple there. And I'll never forget walking up to it. It was just amazing. It had these two giant stone dragons that went for like hundreds of feet. These big green dragons, you know, oh, that, cool. that, yeah. And we walked in and, and all the monks were wearing robes. Well, I felt like, I remember that old TV show, Kung Fu? I right. felt like I, I warped, <laughs> I like was suddenly on the set of Kung Fu. And uh, there was a statue of Buddha there. And I was so enthralled with it. They asked me if I would like to make a donation to the temple and in exchange, in other words, so essentially I bought it, but I made a donation. Right. Through yeah, a donation, and, and, you bought it. <laughs> yeah. And so I carried this Buddha. It was like all through Asia and nice. can't believe it got, got it back. energy in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was such an honor to go there and to speak to the monks. They didn't really speak English, but my traveling partner, Billy, he's a guy I grew up with and we can talk more about him in a bit. In fact, he's in, he's in both my books, Evidence of Eternity and in my latest book, The Afterlife Frequency, because he's just one of, he was my chosen brother. We met when we were 11, we grew up together and he was teaching English in Japan to executives and he had a gift for languages. So he spoke Japanese, Thai, Indonesian, some Cantonese. And so I took like a month off and went to Asia. And it was just an amazing experience because I get got to meet with and converse and pray with Buddhist monks and, wow. and people of other religions. And so every time I look at that, it just really <laughs> touches my heartstrings. Yeah. Oh, I totally love that too. I love to travel and bring back artifacts like that. And it can just be a little thing. Like for me, I like stones or it could be any little thing that sparks that piece of memory and that connection. And that's so true about spiritual artifacts, especially if they're, we can do that through a donation place or we're really helping to support that community, which lots of times doesn't have that financial aspect. <laughs> but what was fascinating when we were in Nam, he and I were the only people, the Caucasian persuasion, the entire <laughs> town. In Nam at that time, I don't know what it's like now, but it wasn't exactly Chicago. It was like the Mayberry version, it was a very small town. They call it a city and it had a small airport. And wherever we went, the, the Thai people were so thrilled to, to see us. Yeah. And if I can digress, we went to, to this mountain 
Mm. And we had the, these two guides, Ung and Fu. Ung and Fu were a husband and wife, and they were about like four feet tall. I mean, they're really <laughs> tiny people. And Billy and I, I'm six one. He's like, he was six foot. We're pretty big guys. And so the white giants had come. And everyone <laughs> would come out to look at the white giants. And the ties are super friendly people. Oh, and, so wonderful. I love their culture. So they said, we're going to the Buddha of the cave. And I'm like, all right, the Buddha of the cave. And Billy's like, are you serious about this? Like, yeah. So we're climbing up this mountain. And there's this cave at the top of the mountain that has this fabled statue of Buddha that's supposed to be gold gilded. And we're climbing up this mountain and the mountain is just covered in holes. Everywhere you look, it's like a giant piece of Swiss cheese. There's holes <laughs> everywhere. And I'm looking at the holes and, and Ung comes and goes, no touch hole. I go, why? <laughs> Cobra. Many, and I'm looking at this place and it's, and they go, be happy it not rain. When rain, they come out. And I'm like, God, no rain. There were holes please. everywhere. So we're climbing up Cobra Mountain and oh we come up to this huge cave and it's, and, and we're walking toward the cave and all of a sudden hundreds of bats come flying out. We're like, geez. And so we climbed up Cobra Mountain to go to the bat cave. But the then cave. in the cave was this beautiful statue of Buddha mm. and Ung and Fu. They brought flowers and we said some prayers and then they go, we must leave mountain when it gets dark. Cobra come out. And I'm like, okay, we're going. And we're like double timing it down the mountain. <laughs> They're like, okay, this has been quite the adventure. <laughs> Yeah, the, I love that connection sometimes that when you're in that place of fear and spirituality, because it, it propels you into another place of being, you're like, okay, I'm ready to move forward. I get the message. <laughs> that the fear on the border of fear and spirituality, that'd be a good title for a book, Dr. Uh, maybe that should be your next book. <laughs> yeah, you can write the forward. <laughs> that's right, exactly. I think that's a great segue into your new book. And so let's dive into talking about that. So the afterlife frequency. So what was the kind of, the, you've talked a little bit about your story and background, which we're really getting to know you, which I love. What was the inspiration behind writing the afterlife frequency? I can see from the title of the book, <laughs> Afterlife and in Frequency, but let's give you can break that down. I would just love to hear about that a little bit more. The afterlife frequency is an adventure that mm. takes you from the cosmic to the subatomic around the world and into the human soul itself. And I realized that I needed to write a book that explains not just what I do, mediumship, but all forms of spiritual contact phenomenon, near-death experiences, deathbed visions, shared death experiences, out-of-body experiences, vis visitations that people receive, whether when you're conscious or in the dream state, because everything is explainable by science. When I was eight years old, I remember I was looking at the stars mm. with my father, and he was my hero because daddy worked with astronauts. <laughs> right, NASA like, planets, astronauts. NASA planet, <laughs> and we were looking at stars, and he said, Mark, there are no mysteries. There are only questions for which we do not yet have the answers. Mm -hmm. And if enough research and focus and funding is put into anything, we'll have an answer and it will right. be based on science. Now, I was talking about Billy and this story is not in the book. And I purposely Ooh, did not put this, special <laughs> I purposely did not put this story in the book because I knew people would probably be asking me, how'd you get the idea to do this? All right, so I meet Billy when I'm 11. We go to junior high school together, college together. So after college, he goes to Asia, I go to law school. And then of course, I shared a couple stories with him and there's more in, in the, the afterlife frequency. And throughout our entire lives, we'd have these debates about the existence of God. He too, he was from an Irish Catholic family and uh, but he was an atheist. And he said, I, he goes, I don't believe in God. He goes, but I don't understand that psychic thing and how you do it, all right? Because he'd been around me, and every, everybody in the neighborhood knew about my mom. It was like, right. they liked her, but it's she knows things. And of course, I always argued that God exists. And Billy said, the problem I have with it is there's no science. There's no technology that can prove it. And so one of the greatest honors of my life was when Billy asked me to perform the wedding ceremony for he and his wife. He met this awesome woman in Japan and then they're getting married in Florida. And I was a notary public. So I had the legal authority <laughs> yeah. to perform a wedding ceremony. And Dr. Lulu, it was one of those 
shining moments mm -hmm. in my life. I was standing there on a on the podium. It was on this beautiful deck at this nice hotel overlooking the ocean. Oh, wow. Beautiful Florida spring day. Everybody that I loved was there. My parents, his parents, mm. family members, friends, our fraternity brothers from college, <laughs> my best friend, Billy, is my new best friend, his wife. It was just, it doesn't get better than that. It really, right. <laughs> it was just great. And there's so much the story. So I have to keep it shorter for, for the purposes of our time constraints. But about three years, three, almost four years after that, he died from suicide. Oh. And Billy had been grappling his entire life with depression, with alcoholism. And I was absolutely devastated. And yeah. I remember when his wife called me and she said that he was on life support. And she's so Japanese. She said, Mark, I don't know who else to call mm. in this country. She said, they want me to kill Billy. They want me to take off life support. I said, don't do it. And I knew her. She's right. very Japanese, very Buddhist. I said, don't do it. So she didn't do it. And then he expired on his own three hours later. And I'm yes. so thankful that I was guided to tell her because yeah. I know she'd be racked with guilt forever and right. it's hard enough as it was. I was devastated over this news, understandably. Mm -hmm. And about two years later, I'm on the Never Letting Go book tour. It was my <laughs> first book. And my second book was Evidence of Attorney. But I was speaking at a paranormal convention at the Stanley Hotel at Estes Park in Colorado. <laughs> and I highly recommend everybody go there. It's supposedly one of the most haunted locations. But, is that know, where they did The Shining? Is that the same? It, it is. It's where yeah. they did The Shining. <laughs> right. And they did Dumb and Dumber there with Jim Carrey. <laughs> and so it's a very famous and very beautiful hotel. So I had just given my presentation. And I was down on the convention floor signing my books. And my manager, Rocky, she was walking around looking at all the other exhibitors. And she was real interested in all the paranormal investigation equipment. And she's walking by this one table. And this guy named Chris was at the table. And he was displaying the spirit box, which supposedly picks up on spirits' voices. It scans the lower AM radio and EM uh, electromagnetic frequency bands. Mm -hmm. This gets into frequency. She's walking <laughs> by. And all of a sudden, the thing says, get Mark. And Rocky stops and look at it. And Chris said, did that just talk to you? And it says, <laughs> get Mark again. And he said, do you think he means your Mark, Mark Anthony? So they're screaming, Mark, get over here. And I look up and they're like, yeah. and all these people are crowding around the table. So I get up and I run over, I go, what? And as I'm walking up to it, all of a sudden I hear, dude. And I stopped and I looked at it and it said, love you, bro. Whoa. <laughs> and I look at Rocky and tears are streaming out of her eyes. She goes, I know that voice, Mark, that's. I said, Billy. Wow. And in fact, he always called me dude and bro. We grew up <laughs> East Coast, Central Florida and the right. surfing culture. In fact, the last thing he ever did say to me was, I love you, bro. Oh, oh God, I didn't think I'd. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I do that for all my patients too. <laughs> it's good to let it out. No, yeah, yeah, it's, you know. And at first I was like, oh, this is just such an amazing metaphysical experience. But then it began to build within me. And I realized, and this is one of the terms that I introduce in the afterlife frequency. Mm -hmm. This is what I refer to as spiritual synchronicity. I love it. No such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> and it, the spiritual component comes in when a spirit will maneuver events or direct you to be in a particular, the right place at the right time. And it dawned on me, Dr. Lulu, that I was supposed to be right where I was. And it was Billy, the skeptic, who said, there's no technology, there's no science to prove the existence of spirits or an afterlife. Yet, what did he choose to make direct contact <laughs> with was science, technology, and frequency. Mm. And that got the wheels turning. Now, in the interim, I wrote my book, Evidence of Eternity, which does have some, there's a lot of science in there. Yeah. But the afterlife frequency, I went full force into explaining spirit communication on the basis of frequency alignment. Now, for the listeners, please don't 
think that my book is a dry technical treatise. Okay, <laughs> the afterlife frequency. There it is. There it For is. all of you watching on YouTube, there's a picture yes. of the beautiful book there. I love that color yeah. and you can see the frequency. I love it. everything is vibration. Yeah, my, my publisher, <laughs> I love my publisher, New World Library. They actually asked me to, what were my ideas for the cover design? And we worked with them because a lot of times publishers won't, but I wanted it to be very clear about frequency. And it's been endorsed by the top near-death experience and afterlife research scientists in the world. And it's being taken seriously by the scientific community. But it's not a dry, boring technical treatise. Because <laughs> I don't think I, I could suffer- have that from well, you, from your personality. Well, I, I think it would be like a dry book. <laughs> yeah, I suffered through enough of that in law school. I'm not mm-hmm. going to inflict that on anybody. So Boy. I like, yeah, so I'll explain the science and then illustrate it with a hard driving story. And I see... The thing is that the different forms of spirit communication and spirit contact, mediumship, visitations, shared death experience, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, they've all been treated as separate phenomenon, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And there is a commonality between all of them. And as as my dad explained, it's all based on science. People (laughs) think that what you do and what I do is woo-hoo, airy-fairy, people don't understand it. And it's not. Yes, there's a spiritual component to it, but everything is explainable. Mm -hmm. And it all comes down to frequency and energy. That's right. Exactly. Yes. I love that. That's exactly my philosophy. And I take the science of my, all my training, and then I combine it with the spirituality and those together. That's like the best healing method (laughs) on the planet. When you have both of those together, because you can see, I think half of my brain is like a science brain and the other half is like a spiritual brain and they merge together. They're always thinking together and complimenting. (laughs) Exactly. The left brain and the right brain. And when you integrate both of them, And see, everything is made of molecules. We all had to learn that in grade school (laughs) science. That's right, the basics. Right, yeah. (laughs) Molecules in turn are made of atoms. Atoms are composed of smaller particles known as electrons, protons, and neutrons, and Mm -hmm. they in turn are made of a smaller particle, a quantum. That's where the term quantum physics comes from. That also (laughs) healing and technically for the science people, an electron is a quantum because it's one eighteen hundredth the size of a proton. So now we're covered on that. We got our science down. (laughs) Yeah, there's always somebody out there. But the thing is, Everything on the subatomic level is a particle of electromagnetic energy known as a quantum. Mm-hmm. See, traditionally, biology has been in one quarter, the physical sciences and chemistry in another, and they're looked at as two separate disciplines. But when you get to the quantum level, everything is the same vibrational energy of electromagnetic energy of a quantum. Exactly. And everything has, from the subatomic level, a different vibration. So this pen is the same at the subatomic level electromagnetic energy that that I am, but also the same electromagnetic energy that the radio waves this show is being broadcast on, (laughs) that the light from the sun is, the space between the earth, the moon, the sun, the stars. So when you start thinking about that, it really gets heady, but Mm -hmm. that's also how spirit communication works. Think of our world as AM radio, okay? We have frequency, we have vibration, amplitude. The other side as FM radio. So you have two energetic systems that coincide and spirit communication, whether it's mediumship, visitations, near-death, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, are when there is a frequency alignment between Mm. the two. And so that's what I'm explaining in the afterlife frequency. And I go much more in depth so that you have a much fuller understanding in how spirits are able to guide things like spiritual synchronicity. Why are they able to see future events? And there's, and also it helps people heal from post-traumatic stress disorder to which, and we talked about that recently on a mental health summit. We were both speakers there. (laughs) We did. And and as a healthcare professional, wouldn't you agree that to some extent, everybody has some form of PTSD? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I think the basis of trauma is a huge part of my practice. It doesn't mean that I think the part of that is everybody has different levels of PTSD and trauma. And some people can easily transform through that, heal that quickly. Other people, it takes longer. Everybody's on their own individual healing process. But I think we've all had experiences of some sort of stress 
that have shifted us right into where we are in the present moment. And then moving forward, and we can be on that timeline and say, I'm going to let this continue to control me moving forward, or I can choose to be in a different place, to move forward with it in a different place of view, a different place of healing. So I think, yeah, totally agree with that. Absolutely. Because let's say that, like in my case, my, my mother and my father had died, and that, that was very traumatic. My dad was even harder. Um, no, I don't want to say harder. It was different, but it hurt because I actually watched him die. Okay, I actually yeah, saw him take his Yeah, that's a lot more traumatic and then that, just like a quicker sometimes. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. getting a phone call saying your mother died in her sleep as opposed to hearing my father's last breath. But yeah. then, okay, so there is a level of trauma, but let's say that you're a parent who's lost a child. It's deep right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a trauma or you're a soldier who sees people blown mm-hmm. to bits. So there are different levels of trauma. And I've heard in my work as a medium, I help people cope with the loss of loved ones by facilitating mm-hmm. communication with people here and their loved ones in spirit. Most the of my readings I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm the intermediary, right. the intermediary. facilitator. Yeah. yeah. And it's very healing, very empowering. In fact, coming up in, in the middle of August, I'll be speaking at Helping Parents Heals annual mm-hmm. convention in oh, Phoenix. That's great. Yeah. And if people go to my website, you can, the tickets for in person are sold out, but you can get a ticket to watch it virtually. Oh, in great. fact, yeah. And in fact, the presentation I'm giving is the healing power of interdimensional communication which is what I term as mediumship, because what I'm doing is we're in the material world dimension and I'm facilitating communication with the afterlife frequency, the other side dimension. And so if you go to my website, afterlifefrequency.com, I made it easy, just like the book, (laughs) Afterlife Frequency. (laughs) Yeah, and also you can schedule readings with me as well. And I invite everyone to sign up for my newsletter as well to keep everyone up to date on those things because- Spirit communication is an important therapeutic step in the journey through grief. Mm -hmm. What I really like about working with you, Dr. Lulu, is this (laughs) is an integrative approach. You help people in so many ways, like by bringing the pain up. Like when I was talking about Billy, I've told that story a lot, but it still (laughs) really hurts. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Hey, he wasn't my biological brother, but we grew up since or 11. Right. You know, it's a long time to know someone. <laughs> right. That's a friend. You're lucky if you get one friend like that in your life. I have one and, five years old. <laughs> We're still friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah same ex- thing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so no, and yes, I am a professional and I deal with grief, but it still hurts. And he comes through now and again, and he's always got some snarky and funny thing to say. <laughs> to make you laugh and get you it. out of it. <laughs> Makes me laugh. Yeah. yeah. And, but spirit communication is a therapeutic step, an important one in the journey to grief. And then working with you, Dr. Lulu, fills in many other steps because it helps right. people in their emotional and spiritual growth. And see, that's what I like about the era that we're living in now is that grief is becoming a multidisciplinary approach. Mm, yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah, and that's a big part of Helping Parents Heal. It's an organization dedicated to helping parents heal for, and recover from the death of a loved one, and it incorporates spirit communication. So we are living in a very, we keep hearing about how horrible the world is, and yeah, it's a, <laughs> people say the world is terrible, and I'm thinking, when has it ever been good? <laughs> was it during the Black Death in the Middle Ages? <laughs> the plague um, of the Irish community. Yeah, like... the plague. How about the Roman Empire? If you're right. on the wrong side, you got thrown in a, an arena. World War One and Two were not exactly a picnic. The fact is, we now have media that can take us anywhere in the world and right. show controlling us, us you know. to have a specific point of view. <laughs> yes. Yeah, or taking us to to battle scenes in places that were like Somalia, Myanmar, certainly Ukraine, there were just horrible things are happening. Yeah. But the truth is that the positive part of all that is because of more open-minded attitudes towards mm-hmm. spirituality and faith, we are able to have these interdisciplinary approaches. So exactly. Certainly people need to go to you And then as part of the therapy, they need to, or they may want to consider having a mediumship reading with me. Yeah. And I see that so much. I love those points. And with the veteran community that I work with, there's so many parents that have lost their children and so devastating. It's because 
there, a lot of times they don't have that closure piece because they're you're not in the same, <laughs> even in the same country when they have that death occur. And I think that is definitely a piece that I can help refer for that same community that you were talking about, because I, that particular aspect of so many parents that are grieving and they don't have the tools. And I think I like how you spoke about, but is that physical component, that health component, it's that mental health piece, a spiritual piece all together. And we're really opening our minds to in 2022, we've had so many changes on the planet and we're really seeing like, oh yeah, our bodies are so multifaceted and multidimensional. We don't have to have just, there's not one piece and we have all these different pieces. And like you said, that meeting in the middle, that medium, and then having it come together, that's where people are really opening their minds up and realizing that there's so many different ways of healing. Yes. Yes. I remember going to some grief groups at a church and ugh, I don't see how they get people together, introduce who they were, and then show a video. There was a film series that, and with all due respect, made by an evangelical organization mm -hmm. said, read scripture, don't expect to hear from them and get a dog. Okay. <laughs> and I'm looking at this going, <laughs> I'm sorry, but, and then when it was over, I felt that everybody needed time to talk and they sent everybody on their way. You're like, now, oh, what happened <laughs> to the community? <laughs> Where's the community of healing? <laughs> yeah. And it's, can we not watch the propaganda video and maybe people need to talk about their feelings and say mm. as much or as little as they want. So I didn't see how that was particularly helpful. It's an um, old, old school a frame of thought. We have new visions, new codes, new things coming in where it's okay that we can let that go. <laughs> it's not helping us anymore. And then one piece in your book too, you talk about collective consciousness. And that's like that same piece you're talking about. And you can, maybe you can explain that a little bit more. Like when we, from my vision of that, what that looks like is coming together and having group healing where we're talking about things, expressing, Hey, I had this come in to my life and I had this experience. I can relate to you. How can you, we come together and help heal each other? And I think that we've lost that so much on the planet, that community of healing. That's, that is the material world view of collective consciousness, mm -hmm. a very positive and healing thing. What I explain in the afterlife frequency is the collective consciousness. Think of your soul. Now, right. I refer to our soul as the electromagnetic soul. And we know from the laws of physics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. Exactly. As I explained mm -hmm. earlier, everything's electromagnetic energy. And every faith system talks about your soul, your consciousness, the who and what you are, pre-existing the body, coming into the body, moving on after you die. So think of your soul as a drop of water, which is housed in the brain, mm -hmm. like programs on a computer hard drive. It is right. not created by the brain. Okay. It comes in. And then when the body, the brain die, think of your soul as a drop of water that plunges into the eternal sea of consciousness. Mm. And now your EMS, your electromagnetic soul is energetically linked to other spirits right. and yes. part of this <laughs> Collective business. Yeah. <laughs> I've been observing this for years. Edgar Casey referred to it as the universal mind, and many belief systems, like the Hindus, the Buddhists, believe in this. We've heard in the New Age community that we're all cells in the body of God. From near-death experiences, people talk about when they go into the light, near-death experiences, when you die, your consciousness leaves and then returns. And they talk about a, an incredible sense of interconnectedness mm -hmm. where everyone feels interconnected. And so that's why when I communicate with spirits, but people think that spirits are invisible humans with our same <laughs> limitations and that spirit right. communication is one spirit per person at a time. No, you get your collective. <laughs> comes <whole> gamut. <laughs> yeah. Like I did a reading yesterday and 11 spirits came through and they're all energetically linked. And that's why, let's say your Aunt Martha comes in and all of a sudden she starts giving you information about a medical condition. And people mm -hmm. say, well, Aunt Martha only had a sixth grade education, didn't know anything about the medical profession. Maybe not when she was here, but as part of the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's why spirits can transmit to us information that far exceeded the scope of anything that they knew here in this world. And there's many facets to the complexity of the collective consciousness and collective consciousness communication, which mm -hmm. I go into great depth in explaining in the afterlife frequency. Yeah, I love that explanation. And it really helps people to understand, I think, what it means 
to communicate with that spirit world when you're talking, you know, I don't know if you remember this cartoon, but the Casper, the ghost, in my mind, I think yeah, for the friendly yeah, ghost, you know, yeah. you know, people, yeah. I think of that, like when they think of like a spirit world, like Casper, the friendly ghost, like, maybe it's a little bit different than that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is. It's funny when I was a little kid that was playing in reruns and I always liked that, <laughs> that cartoon, <laughs> go figure, but you're absolutely right. It, Spirit communication is by far more complex what mm-hmm. most people think. And on the same level, it's very personal too. Because right. yes, you're going to get your collective consciousness of spirits, your collective coming through, but they're going to be giving spirits which are relevant to what's going on in your world now. And so that's one of the reasons it can be very healing. So they're not only just going to come through and identify themselves, and they may bring up shared memories and things about their past that you can identify them. But collective consciousness communication will also include messages of love, healing, and resolution and protection. They can warn, I call this spirit intervention. And that's a, <laughs> another chapter in the book where they will come in and advise. And here's another story, not in the book. So I don't like to give <laughs> away the story in the book because I want people to read it. You want it people to read it. it. That's what it's about, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That took a long time writing it. I'm real meticulous when I'm writing because I want it to be enjoyable, mm-hmm. at times fun and gripping to read. But I was doing a session and it was a group session and there was about a hundred people there. And this woman stood up with her daughter, her teenage daughter. And the woman's father came through, which is the teenager's grandfather. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the focus was on the teenage daughter. And the words, don't go to the concert, came right out of my mouth. (laughs) You're like, okay. And the girl's, but I'm supposed to go to this concert next weekend with my friends. And the mother said, you're not going now. (laughs) And and so I remember, don't go to the concert. Don't get in that car. Stay out of that car. Okay. And so they, what does that mean? I said, I'm not sure. That's right, you what they're telling know you. The yeah. A year later, I was doing another event at that same venue. And this woman and her daughter came up and said, do you remember us from a year ago? And I do a lot of readings in a year. And they started describing, don't go in the car. And I said, oh yeah. I remember that one. That. Yeah. <laughs> And she said that the teenager, she said, I called my friends and I told them I'm not going to the concert, but you have to be really careful because this psychic said, don't go in the car. She said, it freaked my friends out. So they're driving up the interstate and they were going slower. She said they were so freaked out. They're only going 50 miles an hour. (laughs) And all of a sudden they got four blowouts. Whoa. (laughs) Apparently something had fallen off a truck, like a bunch of nails or something. And they hit it and all four times. How did I mean, yeah. it's bad enough getting one tire, <laughs> but, but four all four. At and, yeah. And they said when the troopers arrived and the tow truck, they said, thank God you girls were only going 50. If you'd been going 80 or 90, you, you probably would have flipped. You could have died. Wow. And so like at the time of the reading, I did not fully understand what that meant. What we heard was don't go in that car. Don't go to the concert. <laughs> so spirits will transmit messages And messages from spirits are about love, healing, protection, and resolution. Mm. Never about inciting someone to commit acts of anger, bigotry, hatred, or violence. We see people saying, I'm getting these messages to start an insurrection to put on a bomb (laughs) vest and blow people up. No, (laughs) No, that, that has nothing to do with God. That has nothing to do with spirits or spirituality. That has only to do with one thing the human ego. Now, mm. brain does manufacture the ego. <laughs> yes, and that's bit, the, some people have a bigger it, ego than others. <laughs> yes, they do. And ego can also be thought of as edging God out. Yeah, sucking uh-huh. it out of your brain. Sucking like. out. <laughs> right, because the ego people, it's all me. I'm so wonderful. I'm so this. It's all about me. Mm. Oh, I don't care if they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when it gets into me as center of the universe, and think about whenever any of us has done something unkind or hurtful to another mm-hmm. person, who did you really, who are you really thinking about at that moment? Yourself. Yourself, right. It's all, Yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not acting out of love. So that's the difference between messages from the divine, messages from spirits are focused on love, healing, resolution, peace, protection, 
never anger, bigotry, hatred, violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point, Mark. I love that you brought that up because that's a really important place to be. And as one of my questions I had around that is if some, if one of the listeners or many of the listeners out there are starting to have some of their own connections to the spirit world, do you have any like guidelines about how they can be open to that communication, release the kind of like the fear factor. I think some people get, oh my gosh, I heard this weird voice. What was that? Things like that matter. (laughs) I do. I do. I'm so glad you asked that. I was here in my office. I was working on the afterlife frequency and I was like, how do I explain that to people who aren't (laughs) mediums? I can see like breaking away. Not everybody's a medium, but we all have the same basic physiology. And I explain physiologically Mm -hmm. how this, how we tune into the other side. Nada, nothing was coming through. Hit that writer's block. It was like a <laughs> shovel right to the face. Boom. All right. And I've written, like you, I write for Best Holistic Life magazine. Yeah. I'm a writer. I've written three books and I'm working on another book and I'm always writing. And I do know one thing about writer's block. When it happens, walk away. So, Take a break. <laughs> Go for a walk. Yeah, you can't like, forest. I'm going to be creative now. <laughs> no, you can't. Know. You don't have a red button on your desk that says, Please activate the creative frequency right now. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Leonardo da Vinci always got criticized for, he'd be working on stuff and he'd take off for a week or so or longer at a time because when he was creative, when he wasn't, he was doing something else. So Mm. I thought I'd take a walk on the beach because I live near the beach and I'm going down my driveway and all of a sudden cold chills and tingles start resonating through me. So I realized this is electromagnetic energy. So I, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I felt directed to go in the opposite direction, not towards the beach, but instead to this bike path. So it's around 11 in the morning and I'm walking down this bike path and I see these two things shining in the light and I walk up to them and it's a nickel and a penny. (laughs) And I hear my mom's voice in my head. If their head's down, it's bad luck. And I burst out laughing because the (laughs) Italian side of the family, we have a superstition for all occasions. All right. And I'm laughing about that. Then I hear my dad's voice. It's money. Grab it. So I pick up this nickel and this penny. There, I'm holding it in my hand, Dr. Lulu. And I go, oh, six cents. And then I go, six cents. And I realize, okay, mom and dad are trying to tell me something, obviously more than about the money. And then I saw an image of my father standing in the ocean up to his waist, holding this blue canvas raft mm-hmm. that he had when we were kids. And I'm looking at the raft. Now, he was a Navy SEAL, a scuba diver, a swimming instructor at the Y. He taught like hundreds of kids how to swim. And then I hear my parents' voices in unison, collective consciousness communication. Mm. Mark, teach people to recognize the presence of spirits, accept the contact is real, feel it without overthinking, and trust the message. Raft, R-A-F-T. And I go, oh, my God. And I run back. (laughs) Writer's <laughs> block on the words just flow out of me. And that's R A F T. They actually walked me through it. Okay, I had the writer's block. So I'm going for a walk and I felt tingles directing me in a different direction. I recognized the science and the spirits. I saw the coins didn't pass off their voices in my head as my imagination. I accepted the contact as real. It's the third step where people go wrong. Mm trust oh excuse me feel without <laughs> overthinking the f word feel the good f the new f word of 2020 the new f feel without overthinking it because it's mm. on the third step the f where people overthink hyper analyze and rationalize it away right. oh it's just a coincidence oh it's just my imagination oh this is ridiculous and boom there it fizzles out right there so when out. you get yeah when you get through that then you go to the trust And that's what I was speaking about before, that messages from spirits are about love, healing, resolution, uh, guidance, not negative things. And so they walked me through it. So I've been teaching the raft technique, not in the afterlife frequency. (laughs) And uh, people have been contacting me right and left saying, wow, this really works. And it can be applied not just to circumstances like that, but also during a mediumship reading, things are mm. going to come through that don't immediately make sense. If so don't sit there. <laughs> yeah, don't sit there and overthink it or overanalyze it during the reading. 
Like I was doing a session with this young lady and her boyfriend who passed, he came through and he shows me refrigerator. No, I go, hold on. I just don't <laughs> fling out random kitchen appliances, hoping to get a hit. There's Hair gotta dryer, be something. Blender. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. It's like, one of the things she said, he was a chef and I'm like, okay. And she said, and before he died, he made this beautiful dinner and I froze it. And then he was killed in an accident. And every day since then, I open up the freezer just to look at it. So there you go. No, it isn't. You didn't say freezer. You said refrigerator. Okay. Everything hyperanalyzed. Look, they got to get me to the concept of a freezer. And every refrigerator I've owned has As had a, a freeze. Okay. And then she burst into tears and realized what she was doing. She was overthinking. And mm. that's what I call part of the no-no syndrome. It's like when I'm doing a reading and people say no to everything. Who knows? Hold on. It takes time after the reading for everything to make sense. All the pieces to come together. Yeah, I was doing a session for this guy and his wife over the phone. And his father's spirit came through and I kept seeing mm. two snakes, mm. two snakes. So I'm thinking, all right, they must have a snake story. But my other interpretation could have been that the medical symbol you're aware of, the caduceus, right. the staff mm -hmm. with the two snakes on it. Yeah. And he said, I feel it's Native American. And I said, why? So my father was full-blooded Sue because I never met my father. He died when I was a baby. And I said, okay, we'll go with your interpretation over mine. I'm just the conduit. So the next day he sends me an email, he took a picture of a page in a book about the Sioux nation and Sioux in the Sioux language means two snakes. No way. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, whoa. And he was so excited. So he, goes, cool. he goes, this makes me feel so connected to the father I never knew to my people. He was just, and I love it when things like that happen because yeah. all I do is present. Sometimes I understand what it is, or I will have an interpretation, but my job is to be as objective as possible and bring th things through. And sometimes it's very clear to me what they mean. Mm -hmm. Other times with these metaphors and visions, See, I always tell people your interpretation is more important than mine. Why? Right. The reading's not about me. About, about you. <laughs> you. I'm the conduit that it comes through. Exactly. Um, on a si similar vein, I was doing a reading for a friend the other day, and her father, or excuse me, her husband came through because she's one of her sons is terminally ill and he's in a mm. bad way. And the father gave a very important message for the son and then switched the focus to her other son who's alive. And, and I saw this beautiful black stallion, shiny black mm. stallion galloping. And she goes, well, we're not really horse people. I go, the stallion's running faster and faster. And I was like super filled with energy. She goes, wait a second. The son you're talking about just bought a brand new black Porsche sports car that's <laughs> black and shiny. And I said, and what's the logo of Porsche? She goes, oh my God, <laughs> it's a black stallion. <laughs> and then uh, we were laughing, but see, she put it together really quickly because this was the spirit of her husband letting us know that he is around her and his sons and aware mm. of what's happening in their lives. Because right. people say, oh, you're cold reading. Really? I just fling out black stallion hoping to get a hit. Random like, word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah ran, ran, uh, refrigerator. Why didn't I say toaster or microwave oven? Right. So, yeah. and, and that's when you work with spirit communication. And this is all part of what I explained the afterlife frequency. Yeah. Once you start building a rapport with the spirits and then they're going to start giving deeper and more substantive and intense messages. It's just what you were talking about at the beginning about that frequency, right? When we're tuned into the frequency and we're accepting or listening at that frequency, then more aspects of messages or health or whatever, when we're in the vibe with our own frequency, those around us, everything starts to um, what's the, the expression? Everything just starts to flow, right? We're in the flow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It starts to flow because one of the big hindrances to spirit communication, whether it's through a medium or near death experience, back to the raft technique, right. but to mm -hmm. the F part, the feel without overthinking part of overthinking. This is what I call the no, no, no syndrome. It's like during a ring, people go, no. And when you know, no, you're creating negativity. It's like you're slamming the door in their face right. and they back yeah. not off. Not a good vocabulary word. I wish we could just strike no. that one from. What you say is, vocabulary. I'm not sure. Let me think about it. And, right. and sometimes people are just so nervous. And I understand that. I was, yeah. on a tel I was on a television show and TV, all these other mediums I see that have TV shows, it's all scripted, edited. 
They'll do a reading, edit it down to 30 seconds. Me, yeah. I'm always in front of a live audience on live TV. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> here we go. And so you have a seven minute segment followed by four minutes of commercials followed by another seven minute segment. So the host of the show, she's really awesome. It was in Houston. And she said, you know, Mark, Anthony, would you like to do readings for the audience? And so I was drawn to this one woman and I said, a younger male coming through feels like goes, yes, my son died. And I said, cross. He keeps giving me the word cross. I'm hearing cross. Mm. She's staring at me. No, <laughs> no, no. Her husband's sitting next to her like this. I like to tell that she dragged him there. And oh, terrified. Yeah. Now you got to realize we're on live television. There's a live audience. There's lights, cameras. So and nervous. <laughs> yeah. People are nervous. And so we're coming up on a commercial break and she's staring at me. And so we know we have four minutes before we go back live. And her husband goes, our last name is Cross. I said, do you mean like your son's last name? And they look at each other. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't know who's in the audience. I didn't know their name was Cross. You can't look at these people and it says my last name is Cross. But her son was giving this. And I hear the host of the show go, oh, my God. <laughs> like that. So we come back on and she said, during the commercial break, they figured out that their last name was Cross, which was what Mark said was the name of their son. And this lady's looking at me and she goes, Mark, go to somebody else. I'm like, thank you. Yes, is, tune into someone else's vibration. The some thing is they, they were just so nervous. They yeah. couldn't think. They couldn't think at all. Right. And that's always. Freeze. You know, <laughs> and it does happen in one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. That's why mm -hmm. I tell people, don't go, no, no sit there and write it down. If you don't understand it right away, it's better to say, I'm not sure. Let me think about it. I don't know just yet because it can take right. hours, days, weeks, even longer for the full meaning. Look at the girl with the, the four blowouts on the right. car. Yeah. Four blowouts. How does that ever happen? <laughs> right. Now I've never heard of that before. <laughs> for sure. I, I didn't either. The trooper said like the, their tires were filled with nails. So there must have been, and it was an interstate. So right. something Who must knows? have fallen off yeah. a truck Blow, or yeah. what, a nail truck yeah. fell over. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. I think we've hit some amazing topics today. And one, a couple last things as we're wrapping up one, do you have any like special message that you'd like to give out to the audience today about how to connect into their health, raising their, vi their vibration around health in general. Health is the most important thing. And if you don't believe me, when you're in a bad state of health, you'll realize it. You have to listen to your body. Your body knows. If all of a sudden you start getting the shakes when you don't eat, well, then you need to eat every couple hours, all right? If you start finding yourself out of breath and winded, or if you find yourself lapsing into depression and you're irritable and you're having a hard time sleeping, get into your doctor, get your lab work done. Mm. Chances are a lot of people, we live in an era now where oh, my child is hyperactive. Let's plug them full of sedatives and drugs and mood right. safe. Instead of helping How about them we start be a real spirit. The, yeah, why don't we look at the diet first? Right, exactly. Okay? Kids are drinking big gulps that are 100 grams of sugar and 100 grams of caffeine. They're eating candy for breakfast with sugary cereals. They're eating garbage all day and they're hyperactive or what they call ADD. So let's right. pump them full of sedatives. No. Start with your diet, all right? No, broccoli, kale, spinach. No, it's not fun. I like eating them. I've always liked <laughs> that. You have to disguise them when it comes to kids. Just make well, it delicious. Throw it in with a spaghetti sauce. It, yeah, so they yeah, don't make, notice it Make it's in it there. fun. In my family, we just grew up eating it. Exactly. You know, just grew up eating it. And I say, start with diet. Before you start getting medications for mood mm -hmm. disorders and pumping your children full of drugs, Let's start with their diet. Exactly. Um, and, and I'm learning this. I learned this from my own personal experience. I was a young lawyer out of school, out of law school, <laughs> out to save the world. And I thought da -da -da -da. I was having a nervous <laughs> breakdown. I couldn't sleep at night. I was anxious. And I had this uh, doctor. He's long since retired. And I think he's passed on now. And I said, doc, I think I'm losing my mind. He goes, 
how much coffee you drink for breakfast? I go, I have three cups at home. He goes, what <laughs> happens cups. when you get to the office? Oh, well, I have some more. And he goes, what at lunch? I go, well, I don't drink coffee at lunch. I drink iced tea. He goes, how many? Well, two or three. What about the afternoon? I have a few diet sodas. And so we counted them up and I had 20 caffeinated beverages Whoa. between 7 a.m., and 7 p.m. No, at night. sleep and we're anxious. <laughs> he said, let's cut back to one cup of coffee at breakfast, maybe a cup of coffee around 10, perhaps a glass of iced tea and maybe, all right. So I went from 20 down to four caffeinated beverages a day. Oh my God, the nervous breakdown stopped immediately. Exactly. It's, yeah. So the thing is garbage in, garbage out. Start with your diet, listen to your body. If you feel numbness and tingling in your extremities, if you feel depressed, get into your doctor, get the lab work, find out. There may be instances where you do need mood stabilizing medications, but let's start with diet first. Exactly. And remember, <laughs> sugar is not your friend. It's a in drug. The United, <laughs> it is a drug. In the United States in the 21st century, we consume more sugar in one day than people did in an entire lifetime in the Victorian era, which is just about 120 years ago. Isn't now, that crazy? That's so crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> and we wonder why 10 now, it used to be six. Now it's 10% of the, the population is diabetic. Obesity is off the scale. AD, mood stabilizing issues. And B cogs, yeah, sugar tastes good. All right, it tastes good. There's but other forms. There are, oh, but there are other forms. Fruit. And that doesn't mean <laughs> no, that right. it's good for you. Yeah, that's a great market. Such an important message and so true. And looking at diet, I always say, look at the foundations of health. If your body is a house, if you're, if you're missing one of those foundations, your house is going to fall over, right? <laughs> so you got to look at water. You got to look at food. You got to look at sleep. You got to look at exercise. Look at those pieces. And if one of those is out of balance, your whole body is going to feel it. Just like you said, with drinking too much caffeine, that is a huge one. I had, I cut out caffeine recently and I noticed a huge piece of my mental health shift, the way that I address the world, everything shifted. Now I've brought it back in, but in a different way. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a huge one. And then let's talk about how people can find you, where they can buy your book, follow you on social media, and then have one last fun question. And then we're going to be done with today. <laughs> Please visit my website, Afterlife frequency.com. You can find out about booking private sessions with me. Please sign up for my newsletter to keep up to date. So I'm going to be on awesome shows like this one with Dr. Lulu Yay. and that, yeah, you can find out about my upcoming events and certainly you can find out about all three of my books are for sale. All my books are also on audio. I did the, the audio book for the afterlife frequency. So my former publisher wouldn't let me read the other two books. Uh, that was a big <laughs> argument we had. That's why I'm part of their, my former publisher. Right now you have <laughs> but, a new uh, one. <laughs> yeah, a new one. But anyway, yeah, visit afterlifefrequency.com and you can find out about that. Also, there'll be links to follow me on social media. So awesome. I invite everybody to do that. Yeah, that's great. And Facebook is Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer and an Instagram is psychic lawyer, Mark Anthony. So we'll put all of that in the show notes to make it easy to get a copy of the afterlife frequency and follow Mark and keep up to date. And with his newsletter about everything that's happening with him and around the world. If I can, I'm very humbled by the response that has greeted the afterlife frequency. It became a major spiritual bestseller and then I found out that it was recommended by Shirley MacLaine, the movie star and film mm -hmm. icon in her newsletter. And I was like, very honored for that. Mm -hmm. I was notified by Columbia University that it had been submitted for a Pulitzer Prize. Wow, congrats. And, That's awesome. Yeah. Then prettyprogressive.com designated as one of the top 16 books about faith in God. And then it recently won the 2022 Gold Visionary Award mm. at the Cover Coalition of Visionary Resources mm. Annual Visionary Awards. And the reviews have just been so good. And I want to thank all these organizations. And I want to thank everyone for your love and your support. I'm so honored. Wow. That's great. Thank you for mentioning that. Cause I think that's important for people to know it's not the easiest step sometimes to write a book. It takes a lot of our time and energy and focus. And when we know that it reaches the world, it's like this, you can feel the love coming back. It's so rewarding. You're like, people like the book. They like reading it and yeah. loving it and reaching yeah. more people. It's really important. <laughs> yeah. It's you've been there. It is. It's such a huge commitment, but it's a, it literally is a labor of love 
Exactly. And when it makes a difference in people's lives, it makes all of it, all the difficulties going through all the rejections and negativity <laughs> totally worth it. Totally. So one last fun question. If you had an unlimited budget right now, what would you do to make the biggest impact on the planet? I would fund cellular regeneration. Um, yeah, to help paralysis, <laughs> blindness, regenerate the pancreas. For example, in the, one of the recent shootings at Highland Park, and there was a little boy whose spinal cord was severed. That little boy does not, and nobody in that position deserves that. So many people that are coping with hearing loss, vision loss, that's what I would do. If I had $44 billion to spend on anything, 44 billion to get respect, that number, <laughs> I would not waste it on something like Twitter. Although I do Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> I would instead put it into medical research like that. I also would like to do something to help us get off fossil fuels. Yeah. And I realize everybody says that it's like slavery. That was part mm -hmm. of the economy. Every, anybody with an IQ above room temperature knew that was evil and wrong and horrible and poisonous. And anybody with an IQ above room temperature knows that fossil fuels are killing, our are, planet. Are killing this planet. <laughs> I have been in the Amazon. I've observed deforestation there and uh, throughout other parts of the world. I have been in Alaska I have seen glaciers deteriorating. I've worked with the scientists with them. I've been with volcanologists in Hawaii and seen mm. what fracking triggered was a big contributing factor to Kilauea. I've been to Venice. I've seen the water intrusion. Oh, yeah. So crazy you know, there. Yeah. It would be very nice to say that all this is propaganda and all that, but- Not possible. Been, <laughs> no, I've been very privileged in my life. I've met Neil Armstrong. Who, the day that we're recording this, it was the, the anniversary of him saying one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. No way. I love yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> 1969, he uh, stepped foot on the moon. And uh, I met Neil Armstrong. I've met Buzz Aldrin, John Glenn, I mm, had a nice. conversation <laughs> with. John Glenn, and I met Mike Foreman, who was a shuttle pilot. And that's a funny story, too. And I met Bill Nelson, who was on one of the space shuttles. He's now the head of NASA. And I've talked to all of them about this, and they all said pretty much the same thing, but John Glenn said it the best. He said, Mark, when you look down and you see our earth and how beautiful and alive it is, he said, you can feel it's like pulsating with energy, not like it is. He goes, then you look into space, and he said, then you realize this is the only place we have to live. And people need to understand that the oceans are not a garbage dump. The right. forests are not for just eliminating. We need to, and we can strike a balance with this, not compromising our standard of living, but use our technology, use the great technology that God <laughs> gave us to develop these alternate sources of energy. Yeah. And so I'd like to see the oil companies stay in business, but shift into a different form of sustainability. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's what, that's what, if I had that kind of financial wherewithal, those are some of the things that I'd like to see done. Great. I love all that, Mark. So important. Thank you again for being on the show today. It was a great pleasure to have you as a guest. And I look forward, I'm sure we have many more conversations. I look forward to having you back on when your next book comes out. How exciting. But first of all, make sure everybody listening gets a copy of the Afterlife Frequency.